Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Stroud and I'm one of the research economists here at IFS and today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about corrective taxation, um, in particular how taxes can be designed to help correct for or discourage certain types of behaviour. So my lecture is going to consider four things. Um, firstly, what exactly do we mean when we talk about corrective taxes and what is the economic rationale underlying that? So we usually take that to be the correcting of externalities, which I'll explain a bit about more about shortly. Secondly, how we can go about setting taxes optimally according to economic theory, as well as some of the difficulties we might face doing this in practice, and I'll talk us through a real-world example of alcohol taxation to try and highlight some of those difficulties. And thirdly, I'll consider a further potential rationale, which is sometimes posited for using corrective taxation, which is correcting for internalities. And fourthly, I'll discuss concerns about the distributional effects of corrective taxation. So, to begin, what are corrective taxes and what is their economic rationale? Corrective taxes are taxes on specific goods, um, which are designed to discourage their consumption or production. Um, in the UK, they're often implemented as excise taxes, so we've got taxes on motor fuels, alcohol and tobacco, and more recently you've probably heard about the introduction of the soft drinks levy, introduction tax on soft drinks. Um, Taxes on these goods raise quite a lot of money for the government, so currently raise about 7% of all government tax receipts. They're also the sort of taxes you hear announcements made about a lot in the government's budget or historically written statements, um, often with appeals to concerns about the cost of living for the individual or concerns about um, the effects that their consumption are having on society. But what I want to communicate today is that there's a really key economic rationale behind how, the, how these are set and that this is what we should use to assess whether or not a change in policy is a positive or negative thing. So, what is the economic rationale for corrective taxation? Corrective taxes are designed to correct for externalities. What do I mean by an externality? An externality arises in a market whenever one economic agent's actions affect another economic agent's actions in a way that is outside the market mechanism, in a way that the first agent doesn't have to take account of when making their decisions about how much to consume or produce. That might sound a bit abstract if you haven't come across the concept before, so I'll talk you through a quick example. So firstly, consider a factory polluting a river where local residents like to swim. When deciding how much they might pollute, they make that decision purely on the basis of their production decisions, how much profit it's going to make. They don't have to make the decision taking into account the fact that that might have an effect on the local who likes to swim in that river. That's an effect outside the market mechanism. By contrast, a factory which uses lots of electricity and therefore bids up the price for all other local factories who might want to use that electricity, that is an effect which takes account within the market mechanism because it's controlled by the price. So that's not an example of an externality. So why do we care about externalities? Why is it something that I say we might want to correct for, or we might think we might want to? Well, the answer to that is it's an example of market failure by which I mean a problem that violates one of the assumptions of the first fundamental welfare theorem and therefore leads to an outcome which isn't efficient. And by not efficient, I mean a situation in which it's poss possible to make someone better off without making anyone else worse off. To understand why externalities lead to market failure, it's helpful to think about how individuals make decisions about how much to consume or produce. And they do this by equating their marginal benefit of consumption, so the benefit they'll receive from consuming one more unit of that good with their marginal cost, and that's their private marginal cost, which would include the price. So to show this graphically, we can look here. So this is their marginal benefit line, this is their private marginal cost, and the individual will choose to consume at a point where these two lines are equal, so here. In the case where there's not an externality, this would be efficient, because the social marginal cost is equal to the private marginal cost. But in the presence of an externality, the social marginal cost exceeds private marginal cost, and therefore, if they were to consume at this quantity, which in absence of intervention they would, the cost would be this amount, which exceeds the price, and therefore this would be inefficient. In the presence of an externality, the efficient outcome would be to consume at a level where the marginal benefit is equal to the social marginal cost, and this gives rise to the deadweight loss, which is the welfare loss as a result of the presence of an externality in this market. So this seems to suggest a potential role for the use of corrective taxation in trying to align 
the private marginal cost with, an with the social marginal cost. You might be wondering, is there not a way of trying to avoid externalities without some sort of intervention into the market? And this is the sort of question that the Nobel winning prize winner, um, Ronald Coase, asked when he said, are externalities really outside the market mechanism? Indeed, he suggested that externalities arise as a result of poor, poorly defined property rights. What do I mean by that? Well, returning to the example we considered earlier about the factory, his rationale would imply that the problem being caused there was the fact that there wasn't a well-defined property right over the clean water or the clean river. His rationale might imply that had the residents had the right to clean water, then the factory would have been able to perhaps pay them to pollute a little bit, and the residents could have chosen then, given the price they were offered, how much pollution they were content with, and that would lead to an efficient outcome. But the problem there was the lack of those, those well-defined property rights. So Coase formalised this as what is now known as Coase theorem, which states when there are well-defined property rights and costless bargaining, and that's crucial, the negotiations between the party creating an externality and the party affected by the externality can bring about the socially optimal market quantity. So this seems to suggest maybe we don't need intervention, maybe um, corrective taxation or other means of trying to solve externalities aren't necessary. But Coase himself was very keen to point out that this is hinges on a very crucial assumption of no bargaining costs, when in reality both bargaining costs money and it's also quite time consuming. There's also a further issue of always defining who we would want to have those property rights. So in cases where an externality affects many parties, that can be super unclear. Consider the example of global warming. It's not exactly clear who we would define property rights to in that situation. So corrective taxation seems like an appropriate way of trying to tackle um, externalities. But how, about, how do we actually go about doing this? What can we learn from economic theory? And what are the challenges we might face doing this in practice? So I'm going to begin by answering this by talking us through some of the theory of Pigouvian taxation and then consider applying this to alcohol taxation and some of the difficulties we might face in actually trying to apply it to a real world situation. So what did Pigou said? Pigou said that the, showed that the socially efficient outcome could be achieved by setting a tax equal to the marginal externality at the socially efficient quantity. And that's what this equation says. So the optimal tax is equal to the marginal externality, so this is the externality gener generated at the socially optimal quantity, which is a function of the tax. And to see why, you can, again, we can return to the graph that we considered earlier. So in absence of intervention, the individual will consume at the point where their marginal um, cost is equal to their marginal benefit, but we want them to um, consume at this level. In order to do that, we need to, in some way, equate their private marginal cost with the social marginal cost. And by adding a tax at the rate of the marginal externality at the socially efficient quantity, which is equal to the gap between the social marginal cost and the private marginal cost, these two are aligned, so the decision that the individual would make in, on their own will be the socially efficient quantity. The interesting thing about corrective taxes is that unlike other taxes, they don't create inefficiencies, they remove them. So the deadweight loss disappears. So this all looks really simple. But in practice, when trying to um, actually apply Pigouvian taxation or corrective taxation, we come across quite a number of difficulties. And that's the sort of thing that people at the IFS do lots of research on. So some of these difficulties include measuring the externality. So I said the size of the externality is the um, vertical distance essentially between the private marginal cost and the social marginal cost but it's not always clear exactly how to measure that or what size that would be. Secondly there might be restrictions on what instruments are available to a government and thirdly variation in the size of the externality across individuals. So I'm going to talk these through in the context of alcohol taxation. But firstly why is alcohol something that we might want to set a corrective tax on at all? Why might we think its consumption is associated with externalities? I'm going to suggest a number of reasons. Firstly, there are relatively high health costs associated with the consumption of alcohol. Um, we know that 5.9% of global deaths and 5.1% of the global burden of disease and injury is attributable to alcohol. That's really high. Um, 
Secondly, roughly 70% of liver cirrhosis is attributable to alcohol. You might be saying that's all very well and good, and that is really high, but these are private costs. These are costs that the individual face themselves. Well, one, there are emotional costs and various other effects on other people, but secondly, in a country like the UK where we've got a national health service, that simply isn't true. Um, the individual doesn't have to face the marginal cost of health. They might, of health care, um, so even if they do face the cost of health, they're not carrying the whole burden associated with this. Secondly, there are a whole load of other external costs. So alcohol is linked to violence and crime. Firstly, almost half of all violent crime is alcohol-related. Around a third of domestic violence occurs when the perpetrator is under the influence of alcohol. And the alcohol-attributable fraction of road deaths is 16.6% for men and 16.7, no, 6.7% lower for women. Um, for women. These are really, really high costs. Um, so given this, it se might seem reasonable to think that the, we should levy a corrective tax on the consumption of alcohol. Um, and given our discussion of Peruvian taxation earlier, we have a framework in which to establish how we should tax this. So we know that the tax rate should be set equal to the marginal externality of consumption. And so we just need to measure the size of the externality, and then we can set the tax rate. Given this, we might anticipate that a tax rate would be set equal to the marginal... We just need to measure the marginal cost, and it will just be a per unit flat tax on alcohol. So I'm now going to show you what the taxation schedule on alcohol actually looks like, and you might realise that it's relatively different to that. So, this, so on our vertical axis, we've got the tax per unit of ethanol, and on the horizontal axis, we've got alcohol strength. Each of these different lines represents a different type of alcoholic product. So here we've got ciders, here we've got wine, sparkling and still, the two different slightly lines, then we've got beer and spirits. So there are a number of things which might seem quite surprising about this, but first I'm just going to show you um, as a baseline the situation in which I was hypothesising earlier. If we had a flat per unit tax, it would look like that. Not necessarily at about 22 or 3, but equal to the marginal externality. Um, so the first thing that I at least find surprising about this is that we see some of the schedules, so for wine and for cider, declining in the strength of alcohol. So that means that the per unit tax actually decreases as drinks get stronger. This seems really bizarre. We know, we know that the tax rate should be set equal to the marginal externality, so unless you think the externality is getting smaller for stronger cider and wine, why is this the case? Well. The government is restricted in the instruments it can use in this context. There are regulations which require um, it to tax cider and wine on, a con on the content of volume, not on the content of ethanol in it, um, which means that for a given tax rate per litre of product, higher strength products face a lower per unit rate of alcohol tax. To see this a bit more clearly, I'll talk you through an example. So wine of strength 5.5 to 15% is all taxed at 288 pence, 65 to be precise, um, per unit, per litre of product. This means that wine of strength 8% is taxed at 36 pence per unit of alcohol, whereas wine of strength 15% is only taxed at 19 pence per unit of ethanol. This sets up really bizarre incentives. And this key points to a really key principle that is going to be essential to your knowledge of corrective taxation, which is you should levy the corrective tax as closely as possible on the externality generating substance. So in this context, it shouldn't just be on a bottle of wine, it should be on the ethanol product. And you might apply this ra rationale similarly to wanting to taxate fuel rather than carb in absence of other reasonings. Right, so returning to this tax schedule. So I've said that the declining schedules look a bit funny, but there might be something else which looks a bit odd. You'll see that there are different products are taxed differently and at, di at different rates. Insofar as we think the externality generating factor is the ethanol content of the product rather than anything else, then this also seems bizarre because why does a unit of alcohol from wine cause um, a different amount of externality to a unit from cider? It's not necessarily clear. But I'm going to suggest that there is actually some really good reasoning behind having different, not necessarily this schedule, but behind having differentiated um, taxes on different products. And that comes down to the fact that the size of the externality will vary across people.
So, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a large amount of evidence that suggests that externalities are convex in alcohol consumption, by which I mean the more you drink, the greater the cost of the next unit of alcohol. It's pretty intuitive. You have one beer, you're less likely to do something stupid. You're five or six, you're going to do something stupid. And we see this in a number of ways. Firstly, with diseases, there are threshold effects, particularly with things like liver cirrhosis, um, where after one or two beers, the risk is relatively small, but the more you have, the risk is sharply elevated. Um, we also see it with risk of accidents. So the odds of injury after one beer is 18 eight, after eight pints is 18 times higher than the odds of injury from one. Um, so we see that on a given, for a given person, the more you drink, the more higher the costs associated. But we also know that different people drink vastly different amounts of alcohol. So this slightly confusing graph shows the distribution of drinks per adult per week. Um, so on the left hand, we've got household, well, we've got individuals who don't drink very much alcohol at all. So we'll have on average zero or one or two um, drinks per week. And on the right hand, we've got people who have up to 40. The red lines represent quintiles of drinks. So what we see is that 3% of individuals or adults in a given week will drink 20% of all the drinks drunk that week. Then we see 3 plus 6, 9% of adults will drink 40%. And 19% of adults will drink 60% of all the drinks drunk this week. So we've already shown that people, um, that on a given occasion, drinking more gives rise to a greater externality but also now we know there's a relatively small number of people who do so. But the problem is we have to set a single tax rate which is faced by all individuals. And in doing so, there are going to be individuals who have very low externality generating behavior, who have faced way too high a tax rate, and other individuals who are facing too low a tax rate in order to offset some of their behavior. In this context, how would we optimally set corrective taxation? Well, recall that the optimum Pigouvian tax that achieves the first best is to set the, marginal tax, the tax rate equal to the marginal externality. In an ideal world, this would mean charging different tax rates to different individuals, even on different consumption occasions. So if a bartender knows you're on your fifth drink, they could charge you more if they know you're on your tenth, and so on. Um, there would be ethical issues with this. But increasingly, in a world of big data, this is a feasible concept. Um, so... But this isn't something which we're at the point of anywhere near being at now. So we have to set a single tax rate for consumers. How do we go about doing this optimally? As I've said, there'll be a trade-off between reducing the consumption of people who consume more than is optimal and making those who, pay, who consume less than optimal pay too much. So Diamond showed that the second best ethanol tax in this case is to set a tax equal to the weighted average of marginal externalities which that's not come out very well, but that's meant to be a weighted sum. Um, but I'm going to suggest today, as some of my colleagues have done research on here, that by varying rates across different products, we can improve upon this. So how is that? We know that it's the consumption of ethanol which generates externality, but insofar as consumption of ethanol is correlated with other sort of preferences over things such as flavour, product type or strength, we can try and target individuals who have higher externality generating behaviour. And that's by taxing more heavily products which they consume heavily, but also taxing products which they're quite price responsive to. So in order to do this, we can use data to inform our decisions. And that's what these two graphs show. So these two graphs show the average price and alcohol strength of drinks consumed by light and heavy drinkers. So on the left-hand side, we've got light drinkers, and on the right-hand side, we've got heavy drinkers. What we see is that the average drink consumed by heavy drinkers tend to be cheap and strong. And this gives us some sort of basis into thinking about which drinks we might want to target with heavier drinks if we're trying to target their externality-generating behaviour in particular. However, we also need to take into account how individuals might respond to such taxation. So that's what this graph looks at. We look at the price elasticity of demand to ethanol. So that's your, how likely you are to reduce your consumption of any alcohol product relative to switching to just other alcohol products.
Again, along the horizontal axis, we've got units of alcohol drunk per week. So we've got light drinkers on the left and white drink, um, heavy drinkers on the right. And on the vertical axis, we've got price elasticity of demand. What we see is for light drinkers, they're a lot more price responsive. So a lot more, you put a tax on their drink, much more likely to just stop drinking alcohol in general. If you've got heavy drinkers, they're much more likely to switch to another alcoholic product. This doesn't mean that we can't make any headway with trying to target um, corrective taxation, but it does like, highlight the difficulty of trying to effectively target such taxation, because the people you want to target are more likely to just switch to other drinks. That being said, some of my colleagues here have done some work trying to characterise the optimal tax system in such a setting, given what we know about how price responsive different, house, different individuals are and what they tend to consume. And they've pointed to three potential um, scope areas of potential for welfare gains. And this is firstly, as we've already mentioned, levying taxes on ethanol rather than on volume. So that was in the cases of wine and cider that we considered earlier. Um, secondly, increasing the tax rate on cider. So as you may have seen, and I'll show you again in a minute, the tax rate on cider was much lower than other products. And thirdly, reducing the tax rate on spirits which are relatively weak, so below 20% in strength, and increasing the rate of tax on spirits which are relatively strong, so above 20% in strength. And these are the graphs which show the difference. So this is the graph I showed you earlier, where again you've got wine, uh, spirits and cider, and this is the optimal UK system which they've characterised under a set of relatively realistic assumptions. So you can see there will be some relatively obvious differences, as I've said, you've got rid of the downwards um, schedules, and you've got a bit more variation within products as well. So, thirdly, <coughs> we've discussed so far how, in theory, we'd want to set corrective taxes in order to correct for externalities, <coughs> as well as some of the practical difficulties of doing so. There's also another rationale which is sometimes put forward for using corrective taxations, and that's correcting for internalities. So what do I mean by an internality? Well, in the same way that an externality is a cost imposed upon someone else that the individual doesn't have to take into account at the point of making their decision, an internality is a cost imposed on oneself that you fail to, fail to take account of when you make a decision. So if you think about when you're making your decisions about what to eat, you might not necessarily think through all the health consequences. In fact, with, we know that eating unhealthy food imposes large future costs on individuals including reduced productivity, worse health, and higher mortality. If we think individuals are completely rational, then we know that they'll take account of all of these, because they, and completely informed. But there's reasonable evidence to suggest that people might suffer from self-control problems. So I'm now going to show you a graph which looks at how often the word diet is Googled between 2013 and 2017. If my clicker will work. There we go. So... This is, each of the spikes are January, which is where we're at now. Um, and you'll see that just before Christmas, it's completely dropped. So this is in both the US and the UK, with the lines separate. So the trend's relatively robust. Um, and reasonable evidence to suggest that at least not all of us are particularly good at um, self-control. So if we do we want to use corrective taxation to correct for internalities, how would we go about doing so? Well, it's very similar to the case that I talked to you to earlier. Instead, now, the gap between your decisions isn't one of um, private marginal cost and social marginal cost, it's your own perceived marginal cost and your own actual marginal cost. So you make your decision about how much to consume by equating marginal benefit and perceived marginal cost, consuming at this quantity. But the so but for, for your actual best choice would be by equating these. So you give rise to this dead weight loss, which you feel personally. So is internality a good justification for government um, intervention? Well, there are two polar views on this. The first, the libertarian view, holds that individual failures don't exist, and that using this as, as a justification for policy is simply the government trying to impose its preferences against individuals' wills. Um, then there's the behavioural economics view, which is individual failures exist. We have self-control problems, we have cognitive limitations. Um, 
in theory, we should actually be able to, at least to some degree, discern between these two. When you consider cases of whether or not smokers support taxes on cigarettes, if we subscribe to an individual failures or behavioural economics view, we might expect that some smokers would say, you know what, if faced with the lower price of cigarettes, I would, smoke, I would buy and smoke them, but I would actually prefer that they were taxed more heavily so that I didn't have to face that temptation. So the scope to look into some of the evidence there. We also might think that the individual failures view is more convincing when we consider children in particular, who we know do suffer from self-control problems and definitely from cognitive limitations. And in fact, this is one of the rationales often offered for the reason for the soft drinks levy being targeted just at soft drinks. So the soft drinks levy isn't aimed just at discouraging consumption of soft drinks. The idea behind it is to try and reduce sugar consumption. Um, but it's targeted at soft drinks because that manages to target high sugar consumers and also children in, in particular. So it seems like a less paternalistic attempt at reducing sugar consumption. And we can see that by looking at some of these graphs. So these graphs show the share of added sugar from soda um, by age and by um, the amount of sugar, the share of calories you get from sugar. So what we see is people who consume a lot of sugar get a lot from soda and also kids get a lot from sugar. Seems like a relatively effective targeting method if that's what is trying to be achieved. Okay, so fourthly, we're going to discuss briefly some of the concerns about the distributional effects of corrective taxation. Insofar as taxation involves taking money away from someone, it's going to, and we expect that different people will consume different amounts of different stuff, there's going to be effects some people who are made poorer than others. So it is often claimed that excise duties being used for corrective taxation are aggressive. Um, by which I mean they take a larger amount of money from the poor than the rich. And we can use data to interrogate this claim. So this graph shows the amount of um, income, or the percentage of income, spent on motor fuels, alcohol and tobacco, all of which have excise duties levied on, um, by income decimal. So what you'll see is that a higher percentage of income is spent <coughs> on these things by the poorest than the richest. So on this measure it certainly does look regressive, and that would be a reasonable reason to be concerned. However, we might question whether or not this paints the right picture of what we're actually interested in. Looking at the portion of income spent on these items might not actually be the clearest way of seeing this. Indeed, some consumers with low level of current income may have access to other resources, e either that be borrowing in anticipation of future income or saving from wealth in the past. Ideally, we want to know what fraction of consumers' total lifetime income would be spent on these things in order to have a look at whether or not they're regressive or um, progressive. And looking at total spending rather than total income is arguably a better proxy of this. So I'm now going to show you a really similar graph to the one we just saw, but instead of having total income on the vertical axis, we're going to have total expenditure. And what you'll see is that tobacco still is regressive, but actually taxes on motor fuels and alcohol um, fall most heavily upon the middle income earners. So there is still very clear distributional effects in terms of who fills the burden high, most heavily, but it's not clear that it's necessarily the poorest, with the exception of tobacco. So if this being as it is, we may still have reasonable concerns about the distributional effects of corrective taxation. Does that provide a good reason to not use taxes as a way to try and correct for externalities? Well, I would argue that ultimately what matters for meeting the distributional aims of a government is not the impact on the progressivity or regressivity of a single tax, but of the whole system. Um, insofar as excise taxes are an effective way of trying to tackle externalities, because they alter the relative costs of two or various products, then these should be used as a tool. And policymakers can use other tools, the tax benefit system, to offset some of the regressivity or progressivity of those individual policies. Does that mean we shouldn't be interested in the distributional effects? Absolutely not. Um, we really need to understand the distributional effects if we have any desire to offset them. Um, but it just means that we, should, we can still feel free to use corrective taxation as a means of trying to tackle externalities, even if the distributional effects are a key concern for us. Right, so I'm going to wrap up. But to conclude, corrective taxes are an effective instrument for correcting for the presence of externalities or internalities in a market. Um, implementing them often involves a number of complicated factors, so measuring the size of the externality as well as variation in the size of the externality 
as well as um, restrictions on what instruments you can use. But we can use economic theory and empirical analysis, as we've done today, to tackle these issues and help to guide better corrective tax design. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to shout. increasing of the critical tax. For example, we, we know that if, if I buy more wine, I will pay more for it, M more alcohol, I will pay more for it. But there may be one of my friends, he don't like drinking alcohol. I can just ask him to help me to buy it, and I avoid the increasing of this kind of creative taxes. I think in re reality, this tax can easily be avoided by individual, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you were to try and do it that way, there would be ways to try and avoid the system or game the system. Um, but this is just like a suggested improvement or move along the way. But it, it, it's easy to find a bug about the system. It seems that just like a, no, so it's just like a useless system. It is easy to find a bug and avoid the increasing taxes. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Or I, I mean, is that the systems work only if it can test people when it increases the wrong, wrong consume. But if people can avoid this kind of test by some of his friends or by some other ways, it means that this system has some problem and it will not work. So how to avoid this situation happen? How to avoid it? I think that's a question for policymakers, to be honest. Um, we're more just kind of proposing an idea. Um, what do you think of the impact of increasing correct, of corrective taxes on things like the informal economy? Would, uh, would you in, mean? I mean, what if you were to increase taxes on cigarettes or something to reduce the externalities and that? Do you mean on like a black increase, market? Or? Yeah, to increase externalities and something like that. Yeah, I mean, insofar as you're going to... So nearly any policy change will induce some sort of unexpected outcome um that's not a desirable outcome if at least like a massive spike in availability of other cigarettes much cheaper or so on um but that's really a job for the people who enforce these policies and it just means it needs to be supplemented with effective other policies for tackling those problems 